Welcome everyone to a class on New Testament survey. Um, can would someone open us with a word of prayer, please? Let's pray. Gracious loving Heavenly Father, we thank you for enabling us to partake in your lessons and in the teaching. We pray for your presence and peace in this class and for your help to help us to understand more of your word of God. This is name we pray. Amen. Uh, so according to the schedule that I had posted uh, at the start of the semester, I was supposed to uh, put your midterm assessment up for this class this week. But uh, we are a little bit behind. So what I'll do is we'll finish uh, the Gospel of John, and then we'll do the first quiz on everything up to John. OK, so uh, we'll try and finish it next week, and then I'll post the quiz after we finish John. OK, uh, and then there were a few people who were not assigned a chapter to summarize. So I'll whoever didn't cover any chapter in Luke, uh, I have the list of names there. All your names are there, right, on that spreadsheet. So uh, whoever's left, I'll assign some of John uh, for all those who didn't uh, get a chance with Luke. OK, um, so we'll just continue. We, are not going back to previous content for this class because there's just a lot of content. Uh, we'll just continue from where we stopped. Uh, OK, sorry, I need to share screen again. I need to or start the presentation again. <laughs> OK, I think it's working for everyone online. Oh, no. OK. Uh, let me just make sure. OK, I, I just restart the presentation online. I think it's not changing slide. Um, OK, so we came to the end of the Gospel of Luke. We were just looking at a few um, supplements or so some things that Luke talks about, that's talked about in other books in the New Testament and what the New Testament's teaching is as a whole, uh, considering Luke's teaching as well. Uh, so we, uh, yeah, last week we ended with the teaching on the Holy Spirit uh, from the Gospel of Luke and then uh, from the New Testament as a whole. Um, I think we we kind of covered some of these points, uh, but maybe we'll just do a quick. So um, the New Testament teaches us that the Holy Spirit is one with the Father and Son. So the, the teaching on the Trinity uh, talks about the Holy Spirit as a comforter. Um, and the Holy Spirit, although mentioned in the Old Testament, is not fully revealed until the New Testament. So we get a better understanding of who the Holy Spirit is and how the Holy Spirit uh, leads us and works in our lives as believers from the New Testament. Um, in, uh, in Luke, we see, and in the other Gospels, we see the Holy Spirit uh, being mentioned in Jesus' conception and as the one who empowers Jesus to do the ministry that he is doing. Uh, so uh, we know that Jesus emptied himself of, uh, of his divine um, powers and uh, came in human flesh. And so all that he did was by the power of the Holy Spirit, which is why we say that believers today can live like Jesus, because as Jesus walked in the flesh and was filled with the Holy Spirit, we as believers 
can be filled with the Holy Spirit and live as Jesus lived. Um, um, the Holy Spirit was promised to the disciples as a source of their power, so specifically to be witnesses uh, uh, for Jesus. And uh, let's just look at John 16, 5 to 15. Maybe someone can read that for us. Uh, verses 5 to 15. But now I go away to him who sent me, and none of you asks me, where are you going? But because I have said these things to you, sorrow has filled your heart. Nevertheless, I tell you the truth. It is to your advantage that I go away. For if I do not go away, the Helper will not come to you. But if I depart, I will send him to you. And when he has come, he will convict the world of sin and of righteousness and of judgment. Of sin, because they do not believe in me. Of righteousness, because I go to my Father and you see me no more. Of judgment, because the ruler of this world is judged. I still have many things to say to you, but you cannot bear them now. However, when he, the spirit of truth, has come, he will guide you into all truth, for he will not speak on his own authority, but whatever he hearts, he hears, he will speak, and he will tell you many things to come. He will glorify me, for he will take of what is mine and declare it to you, and things that the Father has are mine. Therefore I said that he will take of mine and declare it to you. Okay, thank you. So uh, we see here Jesus promising the Holy Spirit to the disciples after he leaves. So the Holy Spirit was uh, meant to empower the disciples to continue to follow Jesus and to carry out the work that Jesus had started. Uh, and also to uh, for the Holy Spirit to move in the world, right? To convict uh, those who were hearing the message of the gospel uh of sin righteousness judgment uh to help people turn to uh turn to the lord so uh some other ways in which the holy spirit uh is is taught to be in operation in our midst is uh helping us learn and obey god's will uh giving us power over our sinful nature um helping us uh, to be in relationship with God. So we're no longer in relationship with God based on a covenant of law, but on the covenant uh, through the Spirit. Um, and then as we follow the Holy Spirit's leading, um, the Holy Spirit begins to transform who we are on the inside and transform the way we live. So uh, as Christians today, the Holy Spirit continues to empower us for ministry. So like we said, we can continue to live like Jesus because we have the Holy Spirit in us. Uh, the Holy Spirit gives us gifts. So we read in 1 Corinthians 12 uh, that we are all given spiritual gifts for the benefit of the entire body of Christ, right? So um, those spiritual gifts come from the Holy Spirit. Uh, and that is... Those are the ways in which the Holy Spirit continues to operate in us as individuals and through the church as well. Uh, Luke also talks about judging others. Luke, James, and Paul all talk about judging. Uh, in James, we see that we are called to not judge. Uh, so if someone can read this James 4.12, you can read from the slide or from your Bible. Um, James 4.12, and then Romans 15.7a. James 4.12, there is one lawgiver who is able to save and destroy. Who are you to judge another? 
in Romans 15, 7. Romans chapter 15, verse 7. Therefore, receive one another, just as Christ also received for you. Thank you. So uh, we see here uh, that they are saying we should not judge others, right? But we also see in 1 Corinthians 5, 12, uh, that we should be judging uh, certain people in the church when there is sin in the church. So um, those seem to be contrasting teachings. But in uh, 1 Corinthians 5, it's saying we are to judge those inside the church because there should not be any wickedness allowed inside the church. We should not let sin enter the church because from that sin, other people may enter into sin. That yeast spreads through the church. Uh, so we need to take a stand with God against things that do not go uh, in accordance with his will, things that he considers wrong, things that are considered sinful by God. Um, and the other place we're called to judge is Matthew 18, 15 to 17. This is where if two believers have a dispute, you go to the other believer, you try to sort it out, it doesn't work out, uh, they're not willing to listen to you, then you bring somebody else into the discussion. If they are still not willing to um listen to the other person then you go to the church elders and the church elders help you make a judgment or make a judgment in that if the person is still not willing to receive correction then they are uh, treated as someone who is not part of the church because they are unwilling to submit to christ's teaching submit to authority okay so these are the places where judging uh, is said to be necessary. But in Luke, James, and uh, and in Romans, where Paul is talking about judging, these are where it comes to just judging other people, where we are, um, where we are looking at other people and condemning them for no reason, especially not a moral reason. And we're looking at people outside the church uh, and judging them. That's where judgment is very, very wrong, because uh, we, in that way, are excluding people from the church. So we put ourselves on a higher pedestal. OK. Um, OK, so prayer in the New Testament. Uh, Luke teaches on prayer uh, from the perspective of us being children of God. So uh, as God, as our Father, and when we come to him in prayer, we come as his children. So we can come with that kind of confidence that he will hear us, and he will give us better than the things that we ask for. Um, and then as Hebrew 4, 14 to 16 says, we can come with confidence before the throne of God, uh, that we are welcomed into God's presence, and we will be heard because Jesus is our high priest. Right? So we can come before the Father with confidence. Um, Luke also teaches on money. Uh, so Luke 12 uh, talks about not being consumed with the abundance of what we have, right? But trusting in God, uh, for God to meet all of our needs. Um, so let's just read these passages, Luke 12, 15, 30, and 31. He said to them, Take heed and beware of covetousness. For one's life, one's life does not consist in the abundance of the things he possesses. 30, 31, and then 33 as well. For all these things the nations of the world seek after, and your Father knows that you need these things. But seek the kingdom of God, and all these things shall be added to you. Sell what you have. Sell what you have and give alms. Provide yourselves money bags which you do not, which do not grow old, a treasure in the heavens that does not fail, where no thief approaches nor moth destroys. 
Okay. So uh, basically, Luke is saying, don't follow the way of the world. The world pursues riches, but don't live in that same way. Instead, trust God to meet your needs and be generous to those in need. So uh, give from what you have to those who are poor uh, and store up treasures for yourself in heaven. Uh, now, when he's saying to give, it's always we see in scripture that we give out of our abundance. We don't give and then be people who are lacking or we uh, we shouldn't give to that extent, right? So we give out of the abundance that God has blessed us with. Um, and then um, other teaching in the New Testament from 1 Timothy uh, saying that the love of money is the root of all evil. So it's not money itself that is evil, but uh, uh, running after pursuing of money that is evil. OK, so with that, we come to the end of the book of Luke. And uh, we'll just start. I don't think we'll be actually able to go into the outline of John today. Uh, we'll just look at some of the highlights of John. And then on Thursday, whoever's assigned a chapter in John, please be prepared to uh, do that, OK, to just summarize for us. Um, so John is different from the synoptics in that there are no parables uh, at all in the book of John, which is very, very unique. Uh, we see so many parables in Matthew, Mark, and Luke. Uh, John also doesn't talk a lot about the miracles of Jesus. Uh, he includes only seven miracles. And uh, the eighth one, if we consider it a miracle, is where Jesus comes back after his resurrection and sees the disciples fishing. Um, and they've not caught any fish. And uh, then uh, he asks them to uh, put their net in again, and they catch a large amount of fish. That's when they realize that it's Jesus. And Peter comes running to Jesus uh, from the boat. So. If that miracle, if we include that, that'll be eight miracles in John. Uh, and between John and the other gospels, there's just two miracles that are repeated. Um, so whatever speeches are made in John focus more on Jesus himself rather than any moral teaching, like we see the Beatitudes in Matthew. Uh, those kinds of teachings are not there about living. Uh, as per the kingdom. Uh, it's more on who Jesus himself is. Um, the Gospel of John by the early church fathers was viewed as, so one of the early church fathers, Clement of Alexandria, called it the spiritual gospel. Uh, and actually, it was a very, very important gospel in understanding Jesus uh, within the Trinity the divinity of Jesus. So this gospel was very foundational for the early church, uh, right? Because until the church came to be, uh, there was no concept of the Trinity, right? It was with Jesus' coming and the establishing of the church that they started to talk about Jesus' divinity. How does it relate to the Father? Uh, how does the Holy Spirit relate to the Father and the Son? So John's Gospel contributed a lot to that foundational theology of Jesus's divinity and how he relates to the Father and the Holy Spirit. Uh, so that's why it's called the spiritual gospel. Uh, John Calvin said it's the key which opens the door to the understanding of the other Gospels. Um, the rest of that quote is whoever um, I'm not quoting exactly, but it says, whoever understands the power of Christ as it's portrayed in the Gospel of John uh, will be able to read the other Gospels and better understand what it means that Jesus was the Redeemer. So if you, you understand the person of Christ in the Gospel of John, then go back to the other Gospels and read them, you are able to better understand how Jesus is the Redeemer of all people. Um, then John uses a lot of reference to the feasts that were happening. Uh, so the Jewish feasts, he mentions three Passovers. Uh, the other Gospels only mention one Passover that is uh, towards the end where Jesus is crucified. That's the Passover they 
uh, mention, but John mentions all three Passovers, basically the three years that Jesus is ministering. He uses those to uh, provide a sense of chronology of when Jesus is doing certain things. Um, he also refers to certain other feasts. Um, we won't read the verses, but certain other feasts that were happening at the time. So it kind of gives us an ability to know exactly when in the year this happened, that event happened. Um, yeah, John's gospel is highly theological, focusing specifically on the person of Christ. OK, so some of the characteristics of John's gospel. Um, in the old, uh, so references to the Old Testament, we'll read these verses. Um, Jesus as part of the history uh, of the Jews. We'll just, if everyone, I mean, someone can open 1, 11, 2, 16, 3, 2, 4, 22. And in chapter 5, we have a few verses. Gospel of John, chapter 1, verses 11. He came to his own, and his own people did not receive him. OK, so here we see uh, Jesus being uh, connected to the Jews himself, that he was one of them, and he came to them, and they didn't uh, they didn't receive him. John 2.16. John 2.16. And he told those who sold the pigeons, take these things away. Do not make my father's house a house of trade. Here, yeah, Jesus shows his authority uh, over the temple and also that relationship with the father, that he has authority because uh, it's his father's house. Uh, John 3, 2. John 3, 2. This man came to Jesus by night and said to him, Rabbi, we know that you are a teacher come from God, for no one can do these signs that you do unless God is with him. So here Jesus is recognized as an authority. Uh, by uh, by Nicodemus, right? So Nicodemus himself is a Pharisee. He's a member of the Jewish council. And he's, uh, we see in John that he recognizes Jesus as a, a teacher with authority. Um, John 4.22. John 4.22, you worship what you do not know, we know what we worship, for salvation is of the Jews. Thank you. So uh, here, um, Jesus himself is putting him, his, uh, he is stating that he is one of the Jews. And um, he's also stating that revelation of who God is, is uh, belongs to the Jews, or the Jews have that revelation. And uh, chapter 5, there are four verses. Uh, chapter 5, verses 39. You search the scriptures because you think that in them you have eternal life, and it is they that bear witness about me. 40. Yet you refuse to come to me that you may have life. Verses 45. Do not think that I will accuse you to the Father. There is one who accuses you, Moses, on whom you have set your hope. 46. For if you believed Moses, you would believe me, for he wrote of me. Yes, so uh, we see here in John that Jesus is very closely tied to Jewish history. Uh, as the fulfillment of uh, the Old Testament teachings, as a Jew, as a person who uh, can authoritatively speak from the Old Testament as well as a teacher. Um, so let's read John 12, 40 to 41, please. Someone can read that.
John chapter 12 verse 40 he has blinded their eyes and have hardened their hearts lest they should see with their eyes lest they should understand with their hearts and turn so that i should heal them verse 41 these things isaiah said when he saw his glory and spoke of him so here we see uh, that john is talking about isaiah talking about jesus All right so um, we see both from Jesus' testimony and the gospel itself that the Old Testament is pointing to Jesus and Jesus is the fulfillment of uh, the Jewish Old Testament scriptures. Um, in John, we also see teaching on the Holy Spirit. So we read a little bit earlier about that. Uh, from the end of the Gospel of John, where Jesus is promising the Holy Spirit to the disciples. Uh, but right from the start, so chapter 3, uh, John, when Jesus is talking to Nicodemus, he talks about the Holy Spirit being responsible for people being born again. And then he talks about how just as you uh, know that the wind is present, but you don't know how the wind is going to move, that's how the Holy Spirit moves. Uh, so you can't predict how the Holy Spirit will move, but you know when the Holy Spirit is at work. Um, then uh, chapter 4, verse 24, he's talking to the Samaritan woman at the well, and he uh, talks about the God being spirit, and we worship him in spirit and truth. Um, and John 7, 39, where the Holy Spirit is promised. Uh, and it says he was Jesus was talking about the Holy Spirit who had not yet been received uh, because the Holy Spirit would be sent after Jesus was glorified. Um, and then Jesus' farewell speech, which is what we read earlier when we're looking at the Gospel of Luke. Uh, we see the Holy Spirit being talked about as the spirit of truth, the comforter, the intercessor, the advocate, uh, that the spirit is our teacher and will be a witness to Christ, and that the spirit will convict the world of sin, righteousness, and judgment. Um, in the Gospel of John, we also see a lot of repetitive themes. Uh, so one is life and we'll see that word come up a lot through the gospel so this is a very good book to do if you're doing a word study uh, to take a word like that and then study it throughout the book and see what does john teach on life or teach on light uh, because he uses those words very intentionally throughout the gospel uh, so we see here uh, multiple times where he talks about Jesus being the source of eternal life. Uh, chapter 3, verse 15, 16, 36. Chapter 6, verse 47. Chapter 17, verse 2. Um, then he talks about Jesus being the bread of life. He talks about Jesus offering water, which springs up to eternal life. So this is uh, with the Samaritan woman at the well. Uh, talks about Jesus giving abundant life. I came that you might have life in abundance. Um, and then uh, he talks about at the end of the gospel. So his very purpose of writing the gospel is that we might have life through faith in Christ. Uh, so his main goal in this is to show Jesus as the giver of uh, life, as the source of life, uh, right? Which is uh very good reason to start the gospel with that uh, connection to genesis right so when he's talking uh, genesis is the start of all creation uh and the start of uh humanity the giving of life and jesus is connected to the source of life uh throughout this gospel as well and we see light as a very important theme throughout the gospel. So Jesus himself is referred to as the light in uh, the first chapter of John. So uh, so the light came into the darkness. The darkness could not overcome it. Uh, and uh, then it talks about John pointing to Jesus as the light who was to come. Uh, then we see throughout the gospel references to light. Uh, we must work while it is still day, 
because when it is night, we won't be able to continue working. Jesus is talking to his disciples. So that uh, reference to Jesus being the light uh, of the world, being present there with them, uh, and that when he is gone, when uh, persecution comes, um, or when he is put to death, they will not be, he won't be able to continue his mission. So he has to finish his mission uh, before that. Um, Jesus also talks a lot about, I mean, John also talks a lot about love. So the father's love of the son. Um, so he connects Jesus's whole mission on the earth to God's love. Right? John 3.16 is the most well-known verse. Uh, connecting the fact that Jesus' reason for coming to this world was because of the Father's love for us. So uh, he talks about the Father's love for the Son, uh, God's love for people, and then love uh, also in terms of Peter's reconciliation. So uh, after Peter denies Jesus, we see at the end of John, uh, Jesus asked, John, uh, asked Peter, do you love me? Uh, if you love me, feed my sheep. If you love me, uh, take care of my lambs. So uh, he's uh, instructing Peter, based on love, go back and minister to people. Uh, so the whole mission of Jesus is encompassed in love. Um, and then John, as a gospel in comparison to the other gospels, doesn't focus a lot on events or uh, on what Jesus was doing. He's more focused on the significance or the importance of what was happening. So even if he talks about an event, his focus is on why that was important. What did it reveal about who Jesus is? OK, so some ways in which John portrays Jesus, uh, he uses the Son of God very frequently. Uh, so like, uh, like we said earlier, he talks about the love of the Father for the Son. Uh, he also uses this title of Son of God. Uh, so focusing on Jesus' relationship to the Father and how that is significant for us as believers, the fact that Jesus is the Son of God. Um, he also focuses on the humanity of Jesus. So we see at the wedding at Cana, he's present in a very, his relationship with the mother, his uh, presence in a wedding as part of a family occasion. Um, then we see at the well at Sychar, he's thirsty and tired, and he stops at the well. Uh, the story of Lazarus, he's deeply moved and he weeps. Uh, in the upper room, he washes the disciples' feet. At the cross, he was thirsty. So we're seeing uh, not only that divine uh, side of who Jesus is being presented, but also the human uh, side of how he was relating to people uh, and how he, how he felt personally, being thirsty, being tired. Uh, and then we see Jesus presented at, as the Messiah. So right at the start of the Gospel, uh, if someone can read John 1, 41 for us. John chapter 1, verse 41. He first found his own brother Sim Simon and said to him, We have found the Messiah, which is translated the Christ. So right at the beginning, of the gospel, like the first chapter itself, we are seeing that declaration by someone else, like by one of the disciples, that Jesus is the Messiah. Jesus is not saying it himself. Um, we see also John chapter 4, the Samaritan woman goes back to her village and she says, come see a, a man who told me everything about myself. Could this be the Messiah? Um, and then John 6, where the multitudes want to make Jesus king. Uh, that is unique to John's gospel. Um, and then obviously this one term of Jesus being the Logos, which is again unique to John's gospel. 
um, he uses the Greek word logos, which is a word that was very common in Greek philosophy. Uh, so that word um, points to the wisdom behind which all creation uh, exists. Okay, so the wisdom that brought all creation, all of the cosmos into existence. Um, so it literally means a thought or a principle, an underlying principle that is expressed in uh, speech, that's expressed in a word. So that is the meaning of the word logos. Um, if we compare the four Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, uh, we look at how each of them presented Jesus. So Matthew presented Jesus to the Jews. And so he begins with talking about Jesus' birth uh, and connects Jesus back to Abraham. So he uh, goes over the genealogy of Jesus right up to Abraham, who's the father of the Jews, right? Uh, Mark begins the gospel with Jesus's public ministry. Like we talked about, uh, the gospel of Mark is very, very action oriented. So constantly going from one thing to the next that Jesus was doing in his ministry. And so um, Mark, right from the start, begins with Jesus's ministry when he was 30 years. Uh, Luke, his audience is much broader. So he is looking at all people uh, at the whole world as our goal for taking the gospel to all people and Jesus as a savior for all people. So when he is presenting Jesus's ancestry, he goes back to Adam, the son of man. Uh, so uh, Sorry, Adam, the son of God. So the first man who was in existence. So that's the father of all people rather than what Matthew does, Abraham, uh, the father of the Jews. And then John presents Jesus's divine origin. So uh, like we talked about, John uh, is connecting Jesus back to the very beginning. So before all creation existed, Jesus existed with the Father, uh, which is why that whole um, gospel, I mean, the whole doctrine of the Trinity is so strongly based on the gospel of John, because he starts with connecting Jesus to the beginning before all creation. Uh, so right from there, we see Jesus as the source of all creation and Jesus as the means through which creation came to be. OK, so uh, what are the implications of Jesus being the Logos? Jesus is the eternal God. Uh, he is the force behind everything created. Everything was created by him okay, and for him. Uh, but at the same time, he is not just an impersonal force. He's not just some kind of energy that brought things into existence. He's someone who took on flesh and became one of us, related to one of us, came to live with us. So we see both that divine and the human being presented in Jesus. So we come to the end, the last uh, thing, John's exclusions and inclusion. So what did John choose to include in his gospel? And what did he choose to exclude from his gospel? Um, that's a little long, I think. We'll just see how much we can cover before we close. OK, so I don't have this up on the presentation. I'll just uh, from the notes, just one moment. OK, so 
John doesn't choose to talk about Jesus' birth, Jesus' conception, his baptism, his temptations, all of these things that we know from the synoptics are not at all included in the Gospel of John. He doesn't talk about Jesus casting out demons, doesn't have the transfiguration, uh, doesn't have the institution of the Last Supper where Jesus says, uh, uh, tells his disciples to continue breaking bread, continue uh, to follow that practice. Uh, he doesn't include Jesus praying in Gethsemane. He doesn't include Jesus' ascension. He doesn't talk about the miracles. So only, we, like we looked at, he talks about very few miracles. He doesn't talk about the kingdom of God, uh, and he doesn't have any parables. Right? So there are many what we would consider very important parts of Jesus's life and ministry that John doesn't talk about. Uh, but he does talk about Jesus focusing a lot of his ministry in the north. So uh, we looked at last week that map of, um, of Galilee. And let me see if I can find that. So Galilee was in the north, and then there was Samaria. And then there was Judea. So John talks a lot about uh, Jesus' ministry being focused in Galilee itself. Just so I'm not sorry. Okay, sorry, I can't find that map. But uh, so Jesus' ministry was focused very much in the north, the northern part of. Uh, of where the Jews were uh, staying. And so it was mostly in Galilee that he ministered. Uh, so John mentions that then in the three and a half years that he was ministering, about 30 months of his ministry was in the region of Galilee. Uh, so that's where all of the fishing happened, all of his ministry with uh, that part of the, uh, the people of uh, Judea. And then he comes to the south only for all the feasts. So he mentions those three feasts. So every time there's a Passover, every time there's a feast, he comes down to Jerusalem. Uh, John mentions those visits to Jerusalem. And he focuses on those six months that Je Jesus ministered in Judea and Jerusalem towards the time of the crucifixion. Uh, we look more at some distinctive features of John towards the end uh, before we go into the outline. So we'll stop here for now. Um, on Thursday, we'll go into the outline. So just be prepared to share on whichever chapter I assign to you. I'll post that today, I think, or tomorrow. OK? okay. Thank you all. We'll see you all on Thursday. <laughs>